Matt Ridley is one of the best-selling and best-regarded science writers on the planet. He wrote recently that in the face of the coronavirus pandemic, we are about to find out how robust civilization is and that the hardships ahead will be like nothing we have ever known. I spoke with Ridley from his home in Northern England. His next book, How Innovation Works and Why It Flourishes in Freedom, will be published in May. We discussed why the coronavirus caught him by surprise, when he thinks we'll be able to reopen the world economy, why Brexit is good for Europe, and whether he believes that sustained innovation and progress can take place in authoritarian countries such as China. Matt Ridley, thank you so much for speaking with Reason. Nick, it's really great to be able to talk to you, and uh, new technology enables us to do this really quite easily. Yes, it's and you know the coronavirus, if nothing else, has been kind of a kick in the pants to actually start doing more of this type of stuff. We've, you know, I've been writing about how since at least the mid '90s, when the internet uh, and, and you know the World Wide Web really emerged, we've been talking about this kind of thing, but we never really got around to it. Now we're doing a lot of things that uh, you know we can do from the uh, sanctity and the sanctum of our own home. Let me start, you know, one of the things that was interesting when Corona, when the coronavirus really hit the West, when it hit North America and Western Europe or Europe, um, you wrote a couple of pieces that were striking because you are the rational optimist. And um, one of the things that I think was striking to me and to many of your readers was there was a pessimism involved. You, you talked about how you thought we would never be faced with something like this. Can you explain a little bit about what that was and how the emergence of this pandemic has really shaken uh, you know, some of your uh, kind of core sentiments uh, or, or beliefs about progress? Well, the first thing I should say is that I've never believed that the world is the best of all possible worlds and can't be improved, you know, that we've already reached nirvana. So one of the things I'm very clear about in The Rational Optimist is there are still problems to be solved. There are still threats. There are still risks. Um, I personally think we've been worrying about the wrong risks, and this is a reminder that that we have been doing that. But I'm, I'll hold my hands up and say I was not out there saying, watch it, there's a pandemic coming. Right. Uh, I wish I had been, because then I could uh, uh, claim to be Nostradamus. Yeah, I, I was going to say, but it's not like you would be any richer, right? I mean, you might have that, <laughs> you know, you would get the, you know, people would buy you pints some at the pub or something, but uh, yeah, it's right. cold even, comfort to be right. Even that's not allowed, of course. In the yes, that's, that's true. So, yeah. Well, um, sometime in the future. Yeah. But back in uh, 1999, I was asked to write a short book about the future of disease. And I did say in that, if we do have a pandemic that goes crazy, and it's not completely impossible, uh, that combines high contagiousness with high lethality, or relatively high lethality, um, then it will be a virus, not a protozoan or a bacterium. We're on top of those enemies pretty well. You know, it's not going to be uh, like the plague or like malaria, um, because it's it, you know, we're, we're too good at beating those big organisms. It's the tiny ones, the viruses, that we're still pretty bad at. Um, it's going to be re a respiratory virus. Why? Because just look around you. People are coughing and spluttering all the time. Respir there are up to 200 different kinds of respiratory viruses that we give each other every winter. We call them the common cold or flu, but you know that some of them are rhinoviruses, some of them are coronaviruses, some of them are adenoviruses. You know, so there's clearly something pretty irresistible to the virus tribe about the the the, the urban human population uh, in in terms of ones that can inf infect the respiratory uh, tract. Right. Um, and the third thing I said was that it it might come out of bats. Uh, and I said that because a whole bunch of relatively new diseases have come out of bats in recent decades. And in fact, that's been even more true since I said that, because SARS was was after I made that, that remark. Um, and the reason for that is because bats are mammals like us, and uh, it's relatively easy for a for a virus to jump from a mammal to a mammal. It's harder to jump from a bird to a mammal, but it can be done. It's harder. Um, but more, more, more to the point, bats are animals that live in huge crowds. Um, they, they live in huge densities. There's a cave in Texas that is, has a famous bat roost in it. It has roughly the population of Mexico City living in that cave. So um, respiratory viruses are going to enjoy bats and they're going to enjoy humans and there's going to be a crossover between them. And when I look back on the lessons we didn't learn from SARS, which was a really good canary in the coal mine, a, a 
very clear warning that these wet wildlife markets in uh, uh, China were a dangerous place for crossover between species because the animals are alive in the markets. It's mm-hmm. not the, the problem is not bringing meat to markets. The problem is bringing live animals to markets that are coughing and spluttering uh, now onto other species and so on. Um, and we had a, a dry run with a dangerous virus that wasn't very contagious, but it was very dangerous, SARS. Uh, and we should have said, uh, look, this is a real threat. Um, now, I had also taken some comfort from the degree of improvement in molecular biological knowledge. The fact that we can we sequence SARS in three months or something, that felt like electric fast. Right. Because 20 years ago, we hadn't sequenced a single virus. Um, uh and so we knew it's, you know, we'd read its recipe. We knew its its defects. We knew how to attack it in theory. Um, and I had sort of vaguely, in the back of my mind, assumed that vaccine production had speeded up as well. Mm. Um, uh, we sequenced this one in days. You know, I mean, it yeah. was sequencing. A, it was, yeah, well, almost instantaneous. But it turns out, as I now realize reading up, that vaccine development is about as slow as it was 20 years ago. And in fact, I wrote a thing recently about how the whooping cough vaccine was developed in four four years flat uh, in the 1930s by two very remarkable American women. Um, And, uh, you know, four years is not that much longer than it's probably going to take us to find a vaccine to this. So so we, we have left the door unguarded in one respect, uh, or rather we've let obstacles get in the way of the development of vaccines, I suspect. And that's one of the lessons we're going to have to learn. So what about, you know, uh, you know, we assume that this all started at a, at a wet market in China. Uh, China started dealing with it. It was clear to observers as well as, you know, health officials and whatnot, both in China and observers in other parts of the world, that chi- something was going on here. And we, you know, we all discount information that we get from the Chinese government because they're going to lie about, you know, how great they are in certain ways and how safe they are in others. Um, where, where is the failure, say, in North America uh, and in Europe uh, to deal with this? Because, you know, we're never going to be able to control all parts of the world, all of that kind of stuff. What do you think were the fundamental missteps uh, in the United States and, and the United Kingdom, say, in, in, in containing this? Right. Well, I, I think one of the lessons is that countries like South Korea um, were better prepared for this, mm-hmm. and that was partly because of SARS. They they got more of a fright from SARS in Asia than we did in the West, mm-hmm. and they set up this system of uh, contact tracing based on te- on uh, extensive testing that right. they were geared up for in a way that we weren't in the West. Uh, both in the UK and the US, we were very slow to ramp up testing. Uh, for uh, the virus, and testing turned out to be crucial. I mean, that's right. how Taiwan and Japan and and Korea and right. Singapore and others. Singapore actually opened a, um, a a pandemic hospital and kept it mothballed after SARS. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so that was remarkable preparedness. Um, uh, so I, I think that's that's the the one lesson. The other lesson is we relied too much on the World Health Organization, and I think it has very serious questions to answer after this. If yeah. you look at what it was saying in January, uh, it was repeating um, untrue Chinese claims that this virus was not transmissible human to human, uh, and it was praising China to the skies. Uh, and it was ignoring whistleblowers in Taiwan and elsewhere. And of course, this, in recent days, there's been a spectacular piece of embarrassing footage where a, a World Health Organization official sort of pretends not to hear the question when the word Taiwan is used. Right. Right. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, the, the reliance of the World Health Organization on China, the the close relationship between its director general, who's the former Ethiopian health and foreign minister who developed very close links with China and was himself a, a, a leader of the Tigray Liberation Front, um, which had Chinese backing. Um, these are questions that need to be looked into. Because I think if the World Health Organization had run the flag up in January, we all might have reacted a bit quicker. Would you uh, say that South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, Japan, uh, although I guess there's some questions about uh, you know the the extent of infection in Japan, uh, but have they are they exemplary in their response to uh, the coronavirus? On the whole, yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, what what South Korea did was it 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 tracked it it you know tested lots of people, found out who who they'd been in contact with, issued each of them with an app so that so that it can go back through their records and find out 
who they came close to, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is pretty remarkable. Right. Uh, and, the, you know, there turned out to be one super spreader who'd gone to a church and met a huge number of people. Right. And tracking down his contacts proved vital, et cetera. So, so uh, yes, I do think that um, track and trace is the, uh, is the technique that's going to work in the absence of antivirals and vaccines and so on. Because what's particularly dangerous about this virus, as I read it, uh, is that it is highly contagious in the very first few days of, of mm-hmm. infection. So whereas on, in SARS, it's about eight days before you infect someone else. Uh, in uh, COVID-19, it's about four days. And quite a lot of this transmission is happening from people who are symptom-free, particularly young people. Children seem to get very, very mild version. They don't even think there's anything wrong with them. And they go about their normal lives and infect people. And that is a a very dangerous feature. Um, I'll add one other way in which my country in particular was not ready for this, or I myself was not ready for this. (laughs) And that is in January, we were obsessed with Brexit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We were coming up to the end of January, which was the day Brexit was going to happen. None of us could pay attention to anything else. Uh, And so, um, uh, I mean, that doesn't excuse us being caught out in February, but it does excuse us perhaps not being uh, uh, aware of things in January. And of course, that's true of every country. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. America was obsessed with the presidential campaigns. Right. Um, and impeachment uh, whatever before be. that. Yeah. 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 And impeachment before that. Do you think, is there, um, I mean, you are on the one hand, you're, you're interested in, in questions of public health and of science and, and things like that. The other, you're a, a big defender and promoter of freedom, of individual freedom as, uh, you know, I mean, it's in the subtitle of your forthcoming book, Innovation Flourishes in Freedom. Is there a necessary uh, kind of um, uh, tension between public health, as it was practiced, say, in a country like South Korea. We're not talking about China, where, you know, who knows what's going on. They're nailing people who are infected into their apartments, things like that. But say a country like South Korea, a country like Taiwan, um, and the freedom that we take for granted in uh, kind of, you know, the OEC, well, they're both in the OECD, but in, in the developed world. Yes, there is. I mean, we're cl- we're seeing that very clearly, not just in terms of of uh, what you might call the the technology of of uh, tracing people, uh, but also in terms of the police state that we are now living in. You know, where yep. we've got um, policemen arresting people for going on unnecessary uh, walks, right. <laughs> and they 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 look like they're enjoying it. That's yep. one of the worrying things, right, about, about it. But. Uh, what I would say to that is if you want to preserve freedom and not have this kind of draconian police state brought down on you, and yes, I'm afraid it is necessary to be pretty draconian when you're in the middle of a pandemic, uh, as it was during sure. the plague um, in, in centuries past, if you want to avoid that, then you need to unleash the freedom to innovate to solve the problem in good times. And where I think we've been mistaken uh, is we've made it very hard uh, for people to bring forward medical uh, uh, devices, uh, vaccines, uh, drugs, etc., B- partly because of safety regulations, but partly because of just bureaucratic growth. Uh, I mean, if you if you take, th- I have this statistic in my book. How long does it take to get permission? Um, uh, to, sorry, to get uh, what's the word? To, to license for use uh, a medical device on average. Uh, and it's something like 20 months in America, and it's something like 70 months in Germany. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a black mark against uh, Europe, but it's a pretty black mark against America. I mean, right. how can it possibly Absolutely. take two, lo- two, two months to decide whether a, you know, a new hip joint or a new ventilator or, or a new um, uh, personal and protective equipment in a hospital uh, is safe within that time? And the result of that, of course, is that you, what you're it is invisible because what you're achieving is you're deterring people from going into these fields. You're deterring people from in, inventing and innovating uh, in this area. Um, and so you, you, you can't point to it and say, well, you know, sh- show me the, the, the product that, that we could have uh, uh, licensed a bit quicker. Well, the point was he never brought it forward because he looked at how dysfunctional this market was and stayed away. And so it never got developed. So I think that's one of the issues we have to learn is, is, freedom to innovate but you do but there is a tension there is uh, you know i'm not uh, i'm not the perfect libertarian i'm not someone who says that in a um 
in the middle of a dangerous pandemic, the state should have no power to shut sure. down society. Um, uh, on the other hand, we can have an argument about whether we are to some extent overreacting and whether uh, a, a, you know, had we got the track and trace system, the, the mm -hmm. stuff we were all worried about, about tech freedom, the tech lash, you know, if, if mm -hmm. we would, if we'd not been panicking about that so much, then we might have developed the, the, the tracing system that would have enabled us not to shut down schools and hospitals and I mean, not hospitals, but schools and um, mm -hmm. uh, um, playgrounds and things like that. So what is the, um, uh, you know, what is the role of dissent in, in a pandemic? So, you know, and, and I think everybody with, with the exception of, uh, you know, very doctrinaire or anarchists are going to say, you know what, when there is an emergency, uh, that is widely understood, you know, different rules apply and things like that. But when you talk about dissent and things like that, uh, you know, England, well, I, I guess I have two questions. One, should we be maximizing the ability of people to say whatever they want to say? Some people, when you were starting to talk about China and bats, I was just reading a story uh, that I it was at a major news outlet today about how, you know, this is actually coming out of a, uh, a Chinese lab that was testing bats, et cetera. So there's a lot of conspiracy theories that, you know, this disease is actually was grown in a Chinese government lab as some kind of bioterror uh, weapon. Um, people like Donald Trump, people like Boris Johnson early on were, were kind of poo-pooing, uh, you know, the, the extent of this or that it wouldn't be dangerous to begin with. Um, we still have people who are skeptical. I was uh, reading something by Toby Young, the, the British writer who works at Quillette, and he was publishing elsewhere, talking about how, you know, we're, we're simply wrong to shut down the economy because when you look at it from a strictly economic point of view, it's better to have more economic activity because the, the depression or the recession we're causing is actually going to kill more people. You know, again, I'm not arguing in favor of any of these things, but having that robust sense of debate as well as of different authorities. I mean, in the United States, and I'm not sure if it's happening in the United uh, in the UK, but in the United States, the FDA and the CDC keep going back and forth about whether or not, you know, is it a good idea for people to wear masks when they go outside? Uh, yep. The FDA yep. is refusing to allow at-home testing, even though, I mean, you take the swab at home, you send it on. They've they've shown that they failed as an authority, um, and now they're refusing to allow other people to kind of act on their own. What is the role of of that kind of dissent and kind of pushback against authority in in a moment like this? Well, I I personally think there's no reason to shut down debate at a moment like this. Quite the reverse, actually. I think that uh, uh, what this is showing us is there is no monopoly on wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, uh, nobody. Uh, knows exactly what the right answer is. It's possible we would, that, that you know, shutting down, uh, it, it's possible that we were overreacting at the beginning. I mean, I thought we probably were because I'd seen so mm -hmm. many busted flushes, so many wolves had come along and we'd cried right. wolf and it wasn't a wolf. Um, uh, you know, bird flu, swine flu, SARS, um, MERS, uh, you know, Ebola. Now, Ebola was a wolf for people in Africa, but it wasn't for the rest of the world. Um, uh so, uh, so you know, it, it it it's right to have that debate about whether or not this this is a real threat, uh, and it's also right to have a debate about what the prognoses are, because there's been a dangerous tendency in this country, and I don't know whether it's true to the same extent in the U.S. to believe the models to put them on a pedestal. Imperial College came out with a model saying that, uh, you know, up to half a million people might be going to die unless we brought in much more draconian uh, restrictions on people's freedoms. Uh, and that was used to, not to do a, cause a U-turn in government, but to, to, to cause them to bring forward the, the, the lockdown of the economy that they, they thought might be necessary at some point. Um, now, that model is not unchallengeable. It's got some very uh, unhappy assumptions in it. Um, uh, and it was immediately challenged by another model from Oxford University, which I think went far too far in the other direction and put some mm -hmm. crazy assumptions in about how quickly we'd get this under control. Um, but that has reminded us that models are just that. They are models. You know, they ain't they're, they're not scripture. They're uh, not the territory, right? They're a map. Exactly. And that, yeah. by the way, is a lesson for the climate change debate where models have mm -hmm. been, uh, again, deified to a much too, too great a degree. Um, uh, but we'll leave that on one side for the moment. So while I, uh, I, I don't want to stop 
anybody coming out with a, a an article saying, here's my evidence why the Chinese invented it, or here's my uh, evidence why it's easily cured with this quack cure that I've got made out of dandelions brewed at midnight under the full moon, um, or whatever it might be. Um, every, l- let a thousand flowers bloom in this. Let everybody say what, the, what they want, but let them produce their evidence and let them put up with a bit of criticism if their evidence is bad. That's the thing. So I don't mind the, the claims as long as the counterclaims are out there. And in the case of the idea that it's a Chinese bioweapon, I've seen very good molecular biological evidence that that is extremely implausible. Mm. It's also extremely implausible that it came out of a Chinese lab for various, uh, again, molecular biology reasons. So uh, I don't object to the theory being advanced, but I don't think anyone should object to it being severely criticized too. So my, uh, um, you know, I defend defend with my life the, the right for you to say what you want, as, uh, but I also defend my right to criticize you for mm-hmm. saying it. I think, you know, part of the role of skepticism, my girlfriend was saying that when uh, a relative of hers read your take on it, he, he you know, uh, finds you to be credible. Uh, that was that skepticism or the or the ability of you to publicly discuss what you're thinking and how it changes your mind <clears throat> that <clears throat> helped him take things more seriously. So that's another role well, of skepticism. Certainly <clears throat> as, as, as somebody who has poo pooed alarmism about <clears throat> many different things you know the from the population explosion through to climate change you know i i've i've cataloged how um, my life was nearly ruined as a youngster by people scaring me about the future of the world and i feel therefore, therefore very strongly that greta thunberg's life is being ruined by people today and likewise and so i'm i'm gr- i'm all for debunking scares so for me as someone who's almost a professional debunker of scares to come out and say this one is quite scary and we just need to take it seriously, has made some of my friends stop and think. <laughs> um, you know, how far or long are we? Do, or or how, how do we start to figure out, <clears throat> are we in the, the middle of things or, you know, are the cases cresting or is the pandemic cresting or are we in the first, you know, we don't even realize where we haven't even gotten our boots on yet and this stuff is going to be around for a very long time. What are the markers that go into figuring out where we are and whether or not what we're doing is working and when do we kind of reopen things? Mm, yeah. Um, uh, short answer, I don't know. And uh, I haven't got a model. And even if I did, I wouldn't believe it because it'll depend on assumptions. Um, but uh, but the longer answer is that uh, I see evidence that the most of the countries that have brought in lockdowns three weeks ago, like Italy and Spain, are beginning to see the numbers crest. They're not, you know, they're probably going to go on going up for a while, but they're not going up as fast. Um, and uh, so th- the worst is not over yet, but the worst may be over within some weeks. Now, it would be amazing if the lockdowns weren't having some effect. I mean, you know, I I haven't been within two meters of anyone except my wife for uh, two weeks now. Right. That means that I can't have got it in that time uh, and I can't have given it in that time. Um uh, except to her, obviously. Right. <laughs> but she, she likewise hasn't been. So um, uh, um, in that sense, we must be having an effect. What we don't really know, in my view, is which measures are working best. You know, mm-hmm. is it, you know, was closing the schools a good idea or a bad idea because it sent kids back to stay with their grandparents and the grandparents at right. more risk? Um, uh, the, the way I see it developing is that... Uh, we will get better at curing people who get it. You know, some of these things, hydroxychloroquine mm. and things like that may be helpful. Uh, the way in which you just simply lying patients on their front, not their backs when you're ventilating them apparently is, is helping, you know, mm. so we're going to get a little better at saving lives. Um, we're going to ramp up the capacity for hospitalization, for ventilators and so on. Uh, we're going to improve the testing over the next few weeks so that we're going to get better at contact tracing. And once we've done that, we can start to lift these restrictions because we can start to say when it does flare up, we can quickly track down who's at risk and put them under lock and key rather than the whole of society Um, and eventually get to the point where the only people who have got to be really careful are the very vulnerable uh, and the rest of us can get on with a relatively normal life. Now, will that happen in April? I doubt it. Will it happen in May? I hope so. Will it happen in June? I jolly well think so, because I don't think 
we, I mean, I think that's the point where we start to take Toby Young's arithmetic very seriously and say, mm -hmm. um, sorry, we're killing more people by leaving them, you know, locked up with abusive partners, uh, in, alone and in danger of committing suicide, um, uh, workless and unable to, um, uh, you know, feed themselves properly, uh, um, more prone to take drugs and alcohol, whatever it might be. You know, there's a whole bunch of things that'll be going wrong with society because of this lockdown. And at that, at some point, that overwork that's a bigger problem than 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 the coronavirus because there are there are good things about this virus sorry that's not the right word there, there are no good things about it but there are less bad things uh namely the big one is that it does not kill children mm. i mean imagine every other plague including influenza was quite good at killing kids you know smallpox was lethal among children uh, plague was was lethal to children we're incredibly lucky in that respect that this is not not killing children. But of course, that has contributed to the young feeling somewhat invulnerable, and that's made it harder for them to take seriously the the restrictions on movements. What are the kinds of you know we've been talking mostly about the public health interventions and and kind of uh, fallout from all of this. What about the economic uh, you know responses in the United States? Uh, the the federal government just passed the single largest spending bill in history. I was talking to a congressman yesterday who said, you know, when the uh, Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, we didn't pass a spending bill. We declared war on the we declared war on our enemies. Um, you know, is there, from an economic point of view, what are the types of responses that, again, are consistent with limited government, um, you know, that that are likely to work? And what are the ones that are likely to do more damage? I mean, we're still digging out of the of the, of the, the kind of uh, add-on effects of the bailouts during the financial crisis 12 years ago. Yeah, I think the UK paid off its last debt from the Napoleonic Wars just a few years ago. <laughs> Mm, yeah. <laughs> so, the, I mean, the, there is no doubt when you when you hugely increase the scope of government, it tends not to retreat as fast as you would like. Mm. Uh, Britain didn't uh, end food rationing till something like 1954. Um and the argument was always, well, you know, there are some people at the bottom of society who might not be able to afford food. Well, it turned out the reason they couldn't afford food was because food was being rushed, and so the supply wasn't responding to demand in the same way, and so the price wasn't coming down. Do you see what I mean? You know, yes, so absolutely. It was a sort of circular argument. Um, uh, so, And there is a real danger that what we've done is nationalize huge swathes of the economy. We'll find it very hard to undo it. The moment you start to say, right, we can uh, we can relax this again, and we can no, we'll no longer subsidize you for the, for the fact that your business is struggling. A lot of people will say, hang on, I'm going to go bust if that happens. Right. And, you know, so you will, you will, you will see that. On the other hand, the idea that the government steps in and makes it possible for businesses to tick over during this period because we think it's temporary might be quite a reasonable one. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in other words, you know, if everyone was just to sort of say, right, I'm closing down my business overnight, it would be harder to start the economy up again. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, again, there's got to be a degree of rethinking of how we run the economy in the wake of this. There's a whole bunch of things that we can we can take a bit of a blank slate approach. Things that we've said for years, well, you can't do that because there's huge vested interests. Well, maybe when we restart, we can un Can you something. give an example of some of the either the workforce uh, rules or the you know regulations that have kind of been shown to be less essential than maybe we thought? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, well, for a start, the ones around uh, product safety uh, and, uh, you know, not all of them, obviously, you know, we've got to have some, but there's, but it, it's clear that, you know, if, if we suddenly say, right, let's tear up some of these regulations in order to respond quickly, well, then we should have been doing that anyway. I mean, if, if some of these regulations were, were unnecessary, um, a lot of reporting requirements, an awful lot of what's come in in recent years is about um, uh, 
you know, sending bits of paper from one person to another. Um, and this is now being said, oh, we don't need to do that. We don't need to get that bit of paper from you. Yeah, we'll just get the, get the grant out to you straight away. A lot of the complication around tax, you know, it mm-hmm. turns out to be much simpler to run a tax system th- than we thought. Um, so I think we need to have a real drains up look at, at mm-hmm. what, we, what we don't need to do. And likewise, we need to have a, a look at how we as individuals, not just as government, run society. And that's things like video conferencing, things like what you and I are doing right now. Right. Um, I'm going to try and insist that uh, I have an awful lot of fewer face-to-face meetings and an awful lot more meetings of this kind because they're jolly efficient right. at time use. And it turns out the technology is really advanced. Five or ten years ago, if you did this, we'd have dropouts, we'd have freeze-ups, you know, there'd be all sorts of stuff that wouldn't quite work. Um, uh, I remember trying to do a lecture to Texas down the line about eight years ago, and there was a 10-minute delay, um, uh, or no, a, I don't know, it may have been a two-minute delay or something, but it was you know, paralytically difficult yes. to organize in those conditions. And I, I do want to point out that you are in a makeshift recording booth because you were doing the audio version, so this is, uh, you know, this is your makeshift sound booth. You're like, it's like the Abbey Road, uh, you know, uh, studios or something <laughs> out, out there. Well, um, it, it, you know, I was due to, re- to record the audio version of my book um, last week and the week before. Yeah. I had four days blocked out in the diary for doing that in a studio in London. It became clear I wasn't going to be in London. I was going to be at home in the north of England, and nobody else was going to be in the studio either because of social distancing. Um, so uh, we set it up in such a way that I put some padding in a closet which doesn't have an outside window, so there's very little extraneous noise, uh, and I shut the door on the corridor so that nobody walks past etc and it turns out i've got beautiful acoustics i've got a ready-made studio here and all you do is press record on quicktime and right. then send the file to um uh, the producer at the other end and somebody edits it and it's it's just beautiful so um uh the, the you know we're discovering right things uh i'm the number of people i've spoken to who say you know what our regular weekly meeting is happening at <laughs> half the time now right right <laughs> Um, um, well, so let's, I think talk we are- about, let's talk about uh, the new book, uh, How Innovation Works and Why It Flourishes in Freedom. What is the, uh, you know, I mean, we've got nothing but time because we're not going anywhere, but give me the elevator pitch. Give me, and, and of course, we're going to be out of elevators for a long time to come, uh, at least if anyone else is in them. But what is the basis of how innovation works and why it flourishes in freedom? Well, it, it starts from the point that innovation is probably the most important thing that happens in the world. I mean, the fact that people invent new ways of reorganizing the atoms and molecules of the world to be convenient to us is what's made us prosperous, and it's what's made us interesting in the last 200 years, etc. It's But it's the big theme of the last mm-hmm. couple hundred years. And yet it's a mysterious process. And I start from the, the, the point that actually nobody really knows why innovation happens in one place, not another, why it happens to us and not to other animals, why it happens uh, at some times and in some technologies and not at other times and in other technologies. Why did my grandparents experience incredible incredible changes in transport, but very little in computers and communication, whereas I've had exactly the opposite experience, very little change in transport in my lifetime, very big changes in co- computers and communication. We don't, know, we don't know the answer to most of these questions. Uh, so it's a mysterious process. but. Uh, It's not entirely mysterious, of course. We know some things about it. And um, what I do in the book is I tell stories. I tell the story of the invention of the steam engine, the invention of the search engine, the invention of vaccines, the invention of vaping, uh, the invention of uh, airplanes, the invention of cars. You know, I just, just tell lots of relatively short stories about how people came up with this. And from these, I draw some general points. The first is that innovation is different from invention. Um, that coming up with the first prototype or the first idea uh, is not the end of the story. There's a huge amount of effort goes into turning that into something practical, something affordable, something reliable that people can actually use. And that's the process of innovation that, mm. that is necessary after the process of invention, if you like. And it's not quite that simple anyway. Right. I mean, it's often, and the inventor likes to get the credit and often comes up with a completely fake story and this is another point i make that these stories are always made up about how um an apple fell on his head or he jumped out of the bath with an insight or right. or um um uh, uh you know the light bulb went on above his head right um, uh, and actually it's a much more gradual process it's a more incremental process it's a more collaborative process virtually every discovery and invention 
has rival discoverers saying, hang on, I thought of that yeah. too. 21 different people came up with the idea of the light bulb around the same time. Uh, if Thomas Edison had been run over by a tram, we'd still have light bulbs. Right. But what Edison did brilliantly, and this is another theme of my book, is that he realized that innovation is a product. Innovation is something you can set out to produce. You can set up an innovation factory. Um, and what you've got to do in that factory is trial and error. Mm. That's the big theme that comes out again and again from all the innovators um, uh, is you, you try different things, you experiment, and you reinforce the things that work, and you discard the things that don't work. Well, apart uh, from the, the people who are kind of creating those factories, and I guess uh, what uh, Edison was called the Wizard of Menlo Park, right? He had yeah. a big uh, you know, a, a factory of uh, factories, essentially. <clears throat> Are there larger kind of social, cultural, economic, political um, arrangements or institutions that lend themselves to more innovation rather than less? Definitely. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, liberty is a big part mm -hmm. of this. Um, it, it helps to have people free to do things. It's amazing how much resistance there is to innovation mm -hmm. from society, but also from rulers. I mean, I tell the story of, of coffee as an innovation. Coffee comes into Western mm -hmm. Europe around 1500, um, and everywhere, rulers try to ban it. <laughs> uh, and, the, the, you know, the, the coffee wars go on for a couple of hundred years. Now, yeah. why are they doing this? Two reasons. One, because the wine industry is lobbying them to ban it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And two, uh, because coffee tends to be drunk in coffee houses. Yeah. And the trouble with coffee houses is that people sit in them and they chat about the people running society <laughs> and they're rude about them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and King spotted this and said, hang on, we can't have coffee houses. People might talk about right. me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a uh, huge amount of resistance to, to innovation. And uh, so somehow you've got to set up society so you can get around that resistance. And that means right. giving people a certain amount of liberty. And one way to do that, it, it emerges, is to have fragmented um, governance so mm -hmm. uh, to to be a federal structure or a, a, a fragmented continent right. so europe's great advantage when it got going was that it had lots of different small countries and lots of invade inventors and innovators moved from one country to another right. to find a more congenial regime uh, and that couldn't happen in china it had happened in china interestingly 500 years before when china was incredibly innovative mm -hmm. um uh, because China was at that stage fragmented into about five kingdoms and they were uh, rivalrous with each other. Right. Um, but by the time uh, the sort of 1500s come along, the Ming empires are in charge and that has a very top-down structure in which nothing can be done unless it's got a license from the mandarins. Mm -hmm. uh, no merchant can move because he might you know, bring a bad idea from one place right. to another. You literally have to stay where you're born unless you get a license to travel um uh you know it it couldn't be worse as a system for suppressing innovation so so freedom to um uh, exchange ideas because uh, there is no innovation that is a single idea every innovation is a, is a recombinant phenomenon it combines so are you uh are you predicting now with the arrival let's forget about coronavirus with uh brexit then that means that the uk is ready to retake its leading role as an innovative place uh, because it's now not going to be governed by Brussels or, and I'm, I'm being facetious, but, um, you know, no, are I, we, I, is, is be, the breakup of exactly the EU I then think. a good, is that, is it, is it good for innovation or should it be? Uh, yes, is the short mm -hmm. answer. Um, uh, I mean, there are other problems with the breakup of the right. EU and it's not going to happen overnight, although I think coronavirus may accelerate the breakup of the Eurozone. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I give m several examples in the book of how the European Union is particularly inimical to innovation. Mm. How, on the whole, it is a system that is designed to stop innovation. Um, uh, so, three quick examples. One is the utter failure to produce a digital giant to rival Amazon, Google, etc. Uh, in Europe, despite having lots of tech companies, lots of digital industry. Um, and that's largely down to a regulatory phenomenon once you drill down into it. The second is uh, biotechnology and gene editing, where Europe decided to have a one-size-fits-all policy that was essentially antithetical to both technologies. It did it by delay rather 
rather than banning, but um, it takes so long to get approval for a genetically modified crop in Europe that nobody even tries anymore. Uh, so that's clamping down. And the third is a beautiful little example of a um, Sir James Dyson, who's a very good British innovator, um, uh, who came up with the bagless vacuum cleaner. And um, uh, the European regulations um, said that uh, ba vacuum, unlike international regulations, followed by every other country, European regulations said that vacuum cleaners must be tested without dust. <laughs> and he said, this is ridiculous. <laughs> the whole point of a vacuum cleaner is to be tested right. with dust. <laughs> Well, it turned out they'd been lobbied by the big German bagged vacuum cleaner manufacturers yeah. who said who who had to ramp up the power of their vacuums in order to cope with dust as their bags got clogged. So they had this software that caused the, the vacuum to increase its power usage. And this was running into problems with the regulations for trying to reduce the, the power hunger of, of, of uh, um, household goods. Um, so he, he goes to court, and the court rules against him on the grounds that it's impractical to test them with dust. And so he does a freedom of information thing to find out wh why the court thought this, and he discovers a huge ream of correspondence from the German industry to the German members of the court, asking them to um, intervene on their behalf. Uh, right. So he appeals, uh, and he appeals to the European Court of Justice, and he wins. And the European of Court of Justice hands the decision back down to the court, to the general court, saying, right, now please reverse your decision. And the general court reverses its decision. Five years have passed during this process, yeah. by which time he's lost his first mover advantage. The Chinese have moved into the market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and it's no surprise that James Dyson became a strong advocate of the UK leaving the European Union. And we want to be the kind of country that uh, behaves like Singapore and Hong Kong, but on a bigger scale. Um, free trading, open to competition, and trying to be competitive with others. Now, there's a bunch of us that want that, and there are others that don't and wish we'd never left the European Union. But for me, the big reason for Brexit was because the European Union uh, places obstacles in the way of innovation on behalf of incumbent vested interests. Do you think uh, globally, uh, are we in, a, in an era now where there are multiple power centers around the world? I mean, there's China, there's the United States, there's the EU, uh, you know, the breakaway republic of the United Kingdom now. Uh, but other parts of the world are growing in leaps and bounds in terms of, uh, you know, wealth and uh, distribution of power and knowledge. Are we in a good phase for innovation or are we kind of constantly moving towards more and more centralization? I'm a little worried about that because um, uh, America has been the, the 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 leader, the driver, the engine of innovation for mm -hmm. most of the last century, um, and particularly California, uh, and it's been terrific. I mean, it's it's kept the flame alive when others wanted to snuff it out. Um, obviously, the fascist and communist dictatorships wanted mm -hmm. to shut it down effectively. They, that wouldn't have been what they'd said they were doing, but they were extremely bad at innovation. Um, uh, and without America, uh, we would be in, we'd be really struggling for innovative products. Um, and America, to some extent, has lost its edge in that respect. Yep. So, has the, so has Europe. Mm -hmm. Now, China is picking up the ball. And China is innovating in a way that America did a century ago. It's fast, it's nimble, it's it's without much in the way of regulations and rules. And, and like, this is a case where it's not necessarily inventive per se, but it is taking other people's inventions and bringing them to scale. To some extent, but I think China's gone beyond catch up myself. Uh -huh. I, think it's, yeah. I think it's, I mean, if you look at what they're doing with, you know, consumer practices in the market, uh, in terms of how you pay for a meal, how you pay for mm -hmm. a taxi, you know, all this kind of thing, you know, they're, yeah. they're beyond, you know, they, they've, they've left credit cards behind, you know, they're, right. they're, they're, um, if you look at what they're doing with social media, with mm -hmm. online, uh, fine, fine, on uh, retail, online finance, things like that, they're, they're, they're exploring new possibilities. Right. The worry is, does this work if an authoritarian regime is running it? You know, if the world leader on innovation is uh, an authoritarian regime, I say innovation flourishes in freedom. How do I square that with right. China being the most innovative part of the world now? Well, the answer is quite easy, actually. If you look at the life of an entrepreneur in China, um, uh, he's pretty free. 
as long as he doesn't annoy the Communist Party. In other words, um, once you once you drill below the top level, there's very little of the petty bureaucracy and regulations that get in the so way. So, are you saying China is? And I, I'm I'm talking to you from New York City. This is certainly an example of this. I suspect London is where you have these metropolises or Paris, where there is this vast artifice of re- rules and regulation. There's a lot of government, a lot of controls. But then if you're in the city, you can pretty much live however you want without ever talking to anybody in a, in a position of authority. Are you saying China is kind of like that at yes, this point? Yes, I think I am. I think, you know, that, that you know, if, if you want to set up a political, an innovative political party in China, good luck. Right. But right. If, you want to, if you want to invent a new widget, you're, you're mm-hmm. probably off to the races. Now, um, uh, it worries me that, that you know, for me, uh, political and uh, intellectual and ideological liberty goes alongside technological liberty, right. uh, and that without the former, you're going to struggle to produce enough of the latter in due mm-hmm. uh, eventually. Um, so uh, either China's got to liberalise eventually, um, or uh, other parts of the world have got to pick up the the torch. Yeah. Do you think I, I that think some India will play a big part in the in the twenty first century? Uh, oh, as a it, counterweight, it, perhaps. It's to, a pretty uh, libertarian uh, place, India. You know, it's always been a, it's always had a lot of what you might call spontaneous order or spontaneous. Right. I, I mean, it's 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 effectively ungovernable, right? But I mean, it it's is just very, too big and too too big dispersed. and corrupt and all that. Yeah. But it, mm-hmm. it, it it but but you know, and a lot of its innovative brains have left India for right. California and other places in recent decades. And I think that's happening less and less. So I, I would say between them, those two will be big engines. But look at countries like Brazil and Indonesia. You know, I think there's a lot happening. And what's very exciting about the last decade since I wrote The Rational Optimist is how wealthy Africa's becoming. Yeah. Well, wealthy is the wrong word. It's not yet wealthy, but how much less poor it's becoming. Right. The, the growth of economies in Africa is now on a scale of what the Asian tigers were doing 20 years before. And every, and a lot of people said that couldn't happen. Ethiopia has doubled its uh, average income in 10 years. That's extraordinary. Do you think that something, to bring it back to coronavirus, um, the way that the Chinese government has handled uh, the coronavirus, is that uh, potentially, uh, you know, and I guess I'm going back to um, uh, decades ago, Milton Friedman said that, uh, you know, you, you economic freedom happens, people get wealthier when they have more money, they start to demand political freedom. He seemed to predict the rise of the Tiananmen Square, uh, movement or the Liberty movement in China in the eighties. Um, that's gone away. And a lot of people are saying, well, he's, he's been disproven with the rise of the current Chinese government. Uh, actually you can have continued economic prosperity, uh, and uh, increasingly authoritarian state practices. Um, do you think that the coronavirus, by kind of showing the hand of the government, of the Chinese government, as well as being incompetent, d- might that bring back a kind of sense of, um, you know, the need for lived freedom in China in a, in a, or, or political freedom? I rather hope so. I think this is an epochal moment, and it could go very well in the way you're mm-hmm. describing, or it could go very badly. Um, because I think there's going to be a big rethink uh, about the relation between the West and China in economic relations as well as everything else in the wake of this. For example, the just before all this happened, Britain was having a big row with America uh, about the use of Huawei products in our 5G rollout. And um, we were insisting that, no, we did want China to have a role. Didn't Don't worry, well, they won't be able to... Um, uh, be in the core of it and use it to right. spy or shut shut us down. Uh, and America was saying, you're being naive. Um, I think the people who agree with America on that in the UK will now have the upper hand. Mm-hmm. Um, and I suspect there will be a rolling back of that um, issue. Um, uh, and I think there's going to be a lot of people saying we don't want our supply chains to be as reliant on China as they were. Now, that could lead, and of course, this is against a background of an economic um, trade war mm-hmm. between the Trump administration and China anyway, um, that could lead to the sort of trade disputes that Japan got into with the rest of the world in the 1930s, and that didn't end yeah. well. Right. Uh, you know, Japan said, well, if you're not going to let us have rubber, then we'll have to go and invade Southeast Asia and get our own rubber. Um, 
or that's a right. rather crude um, yeah. cartoon version of what happened, but there's some truth in it. Um, so I can see this ending badly. And of course, it's at a time when, for whatever reason, strong men have emerged as leaders uh, all over the world. Right. Uh, whether you call Donald Trump a strong man, I don't know, but he, there's an element of that about him. Uh, and Modi and Bolsonaro and Xi, right. Xi Jinping. Um, yeah, Orban, et cetera. Yeah. And Orban and co. Um, and uh, and I personally think there's an element of technological determinism here that I think social media and the disintermediation of the media, getting rid of the middleman, getting rid of broadcast networks and things like that, has played a large role in this, just as the invention of radio played a large role in the rise of the dictators in the 1920s and 1930s, and just as the invention of print played a role in the Reformation in the 1500s. Right. So I'm, I think technologies do have an influence um, on this. And uh, I have to say I was naively optimistic about what the internet would do to human mm -hmm. uh, conversation. We would all see each other's point of view. It doesn't work out <laughs> quite like We that. did, and we realized we really dislike each but other's point of view. But it's not all bad. It's not yeah. all bad. You know, oh, I mean, no, well, this throw is the baby the, out with the bathwater. No, this is the most bizarre thing, is that even as we have more distributed conversations and more point-to-point -point conversations, we are so down on, you know, whatever we want to call social media. It's it's a little bit odd because it's there's no question, you know, places like the BBC and even the Chinese Communist Party in many ways has less power, uh, less, uh, you know, less univocal power than it's ever had. But and that's a very good thing. I yeah. mean, you know, because there was a tremendously condescending and patronizing view among the intelligentsia that they should tell you what the news was until right. very recently, and we were rebelling against that. And just, you know, just the last two weeks have shown us how much we can communicate memes with our friends. I mean, I don't know about right. you, but I'm inundated with funny <laughs> videos. <laughs> <laughs> on, on, it's uh, you know the funny ones i don't mind it's the unfunny ones so those yes. i don't i don't know how to filter quite yes. yet for those yeah, fair um enough. so uh just as a as a final note um you know what is the is the is there a single marker in the coronavirus pandemic that we can look for and we say okay when this bat signal goes up well that's a bad choice of words when this flare lights up the sky we know that we're you know we're we're getting closer to the end rather than stuck at the beginning? Um, well, uh, it's going to be in the statistics of mm -hmm. how many cases, uh, I think. That's, that's what you're looking for. But it might also be in treatment or prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't rule out that with the ferment of innovation we're about to unleash, that we will come upon something that really is a preventive action or a preventive you know it would be for example we might find out that it's not door handles it's you know something else which is 90 percent of the spread if you see what i mean you know it's unlikely to be everything that it's spreading by and if we can really identify these i think think they will they will change it um uh, i mean and you know i don't give up hope of a rapid vaccine Right. I mean, the the problem with vaccines and the reason they take so long is because you've got to test them in animals, you've got to develop an animal model, you've got to check where they work. Well, this is some place where innovation needs to happen, exactly. right? I mean, we and, can't and, be using hundred year old, you know, medical practices right now. Quite right. And the, what I, the, one of the things I've been strongly saying uh, is that this crisis reminds us that innovation is not an optional extra that we can yeah. decide whether we want or not it's a very very important thing and we have neglected it at our peril we've we we we're, we've experienced an innovation famine in recent years we've done plenty of digital innovation as peter Thiel has often said but you know if you look at the amount of innovation in drugs and vaccines it's been pathetic in the last 20 years and we're now paying the price for that so this shows us we need more innovation not less uh, and we need to, to be prepared to um, not take silly risks, but um, uh, prepared to, uh, you know, run some reasonable hazards in order to achieve uh, great goods. Um, we've been far too precautionary uh, about uh, the cures. And we, ironically, we haven't been precautionary enough about uh, the risk of a pandemic itself. Hmm. Well, we're going to uh, leave it there. And just uh, for a final word for innovation, I do want to remind people that we are talking to Matt Ridley, 
from his closet somewhere in the north of England. So something right is happening. We, you know, we'll be beaming this out to the far planets. Uh, Matt Ridley, uh, author of the forthcoming book, How Innovation Works and Why It Flourishes in Freedom. Thanks so much for talking to Reason. Thank you, Nick, very much.